Hi guys, Andy here. So, I've had my Nexus 6P for just over a week. I've been using it every day. It's my daily driver. So I thought I would uh, give you the lowdown of my experience with the device. If we start off with the design, um, I think it's quite a stylish design. It's one of, I think, one of Nexus's better designs. Well, or maybe it's Huawei. Huawei. Huawei's design. Um, I know there was a lot of talk about the the sort of bar at the top there which houses the camera and a lot of the sensors, but actually I really don't mind that at all. In fact, I quite like that it basically stabilizes the device when it's on a flat surface. Um, we look around the device, we've got power button which is textured, I don't know how well you can see that on the camera, and then the volume button below it. Now I won't like, I prefer them on separate sides, I prefer the volume button way up here and the power button likewise. Um, right there for me gets in the way sometimes of different, I've got a, a new phone holder in the car which actually that's quite awkward with those buttons being there. It's also fairly common when you pick the device up you end up pressing one of the buttons. So I'm not a fan of the locations. The buttons themselves they're fine. I mean, you can see there's a little bit of wobble, but it's not actually something I notice when I'm pressing them. They don't rattle or anything like I seem to remember some, someone once finding with their buttons. Uh, not on a 6P, just on a different device. Um, on the other side, we've got the uh, SIM tray. I will say it was quite a sort of a stiff, firm SIM tray. Uh, it takes a nano SIM, but that's good. It's, you know, when I say stiff and firm, it's kind of a, a, a decent fit, I suppose. You don't want it to be loose, I guess, so no issues there. On the front, we have obviously the uh, the stereo speakers, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, so I've mentioned the bar at the top. We have obviously uh, Nexus imprint. So this is the first time a Nexus device has had a fingerprint scanner. There was rumor that the Nexus 6 should have had a fingerprint scanner in the Motorola dimple on the back. Um, but for one reason or another, it didn't. Um, so the one thing I love with this is that you press your finger on there and it turns the phone on and unlocks all in one, in one go. So you don't have to worry about pressing the power button. It just turns it on for you. Now it's a bit awkward if it's on on a flat surface like so, but obviously there's still still a power button and just your regular swipe. So it's not that oh I can't turn my phone on because it's you know. And also same same when sometimes I've got in my in my car mount you can't really get your finger around the back to. So it did fail fail on an unlock there. I don't know if you you probably didn't notice, but I get a little double vibration if I kind of miss this. There didn't work. If you miss the scanner, every time of you know if you get a decent decent press um, it, I find it very very reliable it's sometimes a bit tricky so if you're not looking and you're kind of feeling around for it and then you find it and you feel the double variation you move again to get a better coverage but because it sort of turns you down on the first one you've got to release and then press again not a major problem but just sometimes like I say sometimes you're kind of feeling around for it and you feel the double oh okay and you've got to just not a problem but just something to be aware of I suppose um, so some people will think well, it's quite an odd location on the back because of some of those reasons I've mentioned, but actually you get used to it very quickly and it's quite natural for your hand to be in that sort of position. Um, which is odd because I remember saying on the G4 and the G3, I didn't like the power button on the back and it was, it was annoying. I don't know if it's because I don't have to press it because you don't have to, I don't know, I'm not sure what it is. You literally have to cover that sensor for it to turn on. <clears throat> but yeah, strangely, I've, I have quite uh, got quite used to the location of the, uh, the, the fingerprint scanner. Um, I mean, the other thing to mention is, well, once you've had one, so I have one on my Note 5, a fingerprint scanner, and obviously now I have this on the 6P. When I borrow a different phone that doesn't have one, you really do miss the fingerprint scanner and the sort of the security that it that gives you. Um, and just sometimes, instead of having to put a password in, you can get away with, you know, for um, LastPass, for example, I can just use my finger on there instead of having to type in a password, which uh, obviously is a lot easier. The all-metal body feels very good in the hand. Um, it's only slightly curved at the edges, but enough that it gives for a very nice feel. Um, it does leave some greasy marks. I mean, I look at it now, you can see a couple of smudges perhaps if the camera's picking them up, but nothing like if it was a sort of a glass back or plastic back. Um, generally, it's uh, it, it's not such a fingerprint magnet, I don't believe. Uh, obviously, there are other colors and they may vary. I've only tried this graphite one, so I couldn't tell if it's better or worse than the others. Um, other thing to mention, Quite a big deal, I think, actually, USB-C. It's quite a big deal for a few reasons. One of them is that you won't have any compatible cables laying around the house anymore. So we're so used to micro USB. Um, I mean, they're just scattered everywhere. You, you almost, you, when you get one with a device or with any little gadget, you tend not to even bother taking them out, if you'd like me, because you've got so many scattered everywhere anyway. Uh, and now, 
obviously yeah USB-C so it's a whole different cable it's reverse where you can plug it either way around you don't have to worry about that it's great um, it charges it up to three amps but again we'll come to that but we're talking about the battery uh, but there's quite a lot of chatter uh, on the internet uh, on Amazon, for example. One of the Google engineers has been reviewing USB, well, USB A to USB C cables, because a lot of them aren't actually compliant with uh, the specifications for USB C. Um, they don't have the right resistors in them. They only, and uh, I'm, this is my understanding. Obviously, I'm not a, I'm not an engineer myself. Uh, they only go up to 2.4 amps, um, and there is some concern that there is. You, you buy a cheap cable that's not got the right specs it could possibly damage your device now I'd be quite surprised I don't think anyone's reported as yet that there's been any damage but I suppose it might be a prolonged you know using it for a prolonged period I'm not sure I don't know um, but the point being to be very careful when you're buying a, a new uh, USB-C cable you want to get one that will, will actually charge at 3 amps otherwise it's not it's not compliant if you get USB-C to USB-C you can't really go wrong apparently they have to then be compliant and, and will charge at 3 amps so that's probably your safer thing but then you obviously need to start getting the, the plugs that take the USB-C, like obviously that comes with the actual the 6P. Um, you may also have seen a video, because it went a bit viral, about somebody bending and breaking their Nexus 6P. Now, this chap apparently, he does tear downs of devices. He very much understands how they're all built and put together. And he knew that there would be a weakness around this point where the power button is. The battery ends there, the motherboard starts. There's not, a, I guess there's not as much metal because of the power button. So there's a video of him basically just snapping his phone in half. Now, obviously I don't want to do that to mine. So my advice would be, well, just don't do that. I mean, he does put a fair bit of force and he's, and he's applying it directly where he knows there's a weakness. So I'm going to move slightly away from that and I'm going to, I'm going to bend. Now, obviously, you, you don't know how much force I'm putting on that, but, you know, there's, there's, to me, there's no indication that this is a weak device. I'm putting a reasonable bit of force onto that and it's not giving at all. Now, I'm sure, yeah, if I press real hard and I pull it as hard as I could there, I'm not going to, uh, that I probably could just snap this in half. But, you want to break something, you probably can. You're going to find a way to break it. Why do that? Just just don't do it. It's the simple answer as far as I'm concerned. So personally, I would say don't worry about that. Yeah, be careful if you're putting it in your back pocket. But even then, this guy's putting a lot of pressure in a, in a specific place. Unless you happen to sit on something in that place and you're putting the pressure either side of the phone, you're probably going to be safe. If that pressure is spread across even just, a, I would I would guess, um, sort of three or four centimeters, like happens most times when it's something is applied to it, you're probably going to be fine. So I would say don't worry too much about this whole bending thing. Um, as long as you look after your device with a reasonable amount of uh, caution, you should be fine. Um, let's move on to the actual hardware inside the device. So it's the Qualcomm Snapdragon 810 uh, processor. There were rumors or there was talk that there were overheating issues with the 810. I haven't noticed any. Um, other people that I've, I've read about and seen, I, I think they've said they haven't noticed any problems. So again, these things get out there on the internet and everyone thinks it's a massive big issue. Personally, I don't believe it is. Inside there as well we have uh, two quad-core processors, a 1.55 gigahertz Cortex A53 and a 2 gigahertz Cortex A57. So octa-core uh, processing power. The uh, GPU is an Adreno 430. Uh, it has 3 gig of RAM. And then the device, of course, has 32 gig of uh, ROM. But it's also available, this one has 32 gig. It's also available in 64 gig. And I think for the first time as a Nexus device, 128 gig. Um, I plumped for the 32, mainly because I live a lot in the cloud, so most of my music's in the cloud. I don't listen to huge, big quantities of music. Um, all my photos get backed up to the cloud as well. I can delete them off the phone kind of almost as I go, if I wish. Um, and 32 gig has generally been enough. Now, if I filmed a lot in 4K, if I had a big music collection, then definitely you want to be going for a higher, uh, a higher storage. And to be honest, I kind of wish almost that I'd gone for a 64 gig. Um, but then at the same time, they're only just being delivered uh, in these in the next few days, apparently. In this, I've had, like, I've had it over for a week. Uh, it does have NFC built in. Um, obviously, I've mentioned the NF, uh, the fingerprint sensor. Sorry, I didn't really mention the speed of it. It, it does it does seem very quick. I tested it against my Note Five. It is quicker. Um, the screen is Samsung's latest. Uh, latest generation Samsung panel, uh, 1440 by uh, 2560, that's 518 pixels per inch. And personally, 
I think it looks fantastic. Uh, there's a little bit of talk about the brightness of it. Um, get rid of a couple of those notifications. So I'm going to crank it right the way up. It's, I'm never quite sure how well it's going to look on a video, to be honest, because the video, obviously, the camera is going to adjust to, to the different brightnesses. But let's also go in and have a look. Display. Adaptive brightness. Now, watch what happens when I turn off adaptive brightness. Okay, well, apart from the fact that it's then gone to... So let's turn it all the way up. So again, that's it with adaptive brightness turned off. So kind of a, a auto brightness, basically. And then I turn it back on. Do you see when it's slightly dimmer? Now again, some people seem to be talking about like this is news. I'm fairly sure that always auto brightness has been slightly dimmer than, than when, it, and when you turn it off. Um, it mentions their ambient display. We'll come to that in the software. So yeah, personally, I think the screen looks very good, very bright, good whites, good blacks, good viewing angles. Definitely no concerns with the screen. Very, very good. Let's just turn that back down a bit again. Um, this, oh, sorry, and also behind the screen, or protecting the screen, sorry, in front of the screen, is uh, Corning Gorilla Glass 4, so the latest and greatest protection from Corning. Um, so I did mention briefly the speakers. Amazing. Nothing else, you know, no other way to explain them other than amazing. I do like my external speaker. External, is that right? Yeah, external speaker. Um, some people really couldn't care. They talk on the phone, they plug earphones in, but actually I listen to a lot of podcasts. A lot of time when I make phone calls, I just put the speakers on if I've got good speakers. Um, and these, these really have some of the best. Now, I have a directional mic, so you might not hear this too well, but... I'll move it around in front of the mic for a second. Still gonna get it in. I'm up with the bins, even if the light's red. Burn rubber down the block. They actually reached out to me on my birthday and said happy birthday to me last nice. year because I was so excited. They were doing the survey. So I don't know how, again, I don't know how well that's going to come through on my microphone. Um, but these speakers are the first ones on my testing. So I have a little decibel meter. I don't know how accurate it is, but it, it, I guess it can't be that far out. Um, and actually, the number itself isn't so important, but it's about the comparison against other devices. And this is the first one that's ever gone over 100 decibels. I think it went to, was it 101.7? Maybe it's 101.3. Either way, first device ever to go over the 100 decibels. Interestingly, it did it on the music test. So I do three different tests, and it didn't do so well on my, my own sort of Anarchy intro music and also on the podcast playing. It wasn't as loud as a lot of the other devices, but on the music, it romped away up over 100. So really, really impressive. Best speakers on, to me, on any mobile mobile phone out there at the moment and to me actually that's that's quite a big deal as I say I do like my speakers so we're gonna move on to the camera uh, the rear facing camera is 12 megapixel it's got a laser autofocus it's got dual LED flash uh, it can film in 4k at 30 frames per second it's also got a slow motion 240 frames per second mode um, which actually I was quite impressed by I mean, amongst other things it has sound I'm not sure I remember a slow motion camera that has sound really quite amusing in some ways um, the front facing camera 8 megapixels can film in 1080p uh, it's not really perhaps as impressive as the rear facing camera the uh, the sort of shots I took with that weren't you know if I compared them to the Note 5 for example they just weren't quite as crisp and clear um, as the rear but the rear facing camera really did produce some very good results particularly in low light um, it does have sort of larger pixels, only being 12 megapixel, but having a large sensor means that every individual pixel is that bit bigger, which means it can collect more light, therefore it can operate better in low light. And it really did give me some good results in low light and regular light. Uh, the video is an interesting one. Now, they haven't, they opted not to use optical image stabilization in the, uh, in the video, opting instead for EIS, electrical image stabilization which um, is along the lines of it, it, it films a slightly larger image than, than you think you're filming, and as you move, it tries to sort of stay centred on what it thinks the subject is. Now, what I wonder, or someone postulated, was that perhaps it's a bit too, doing that bit too strong. So if I move slightly to the left, and it, it sort of rubber bands it back and forth, and it almost makes it bounce and wobble, uh, to me, there was quite a strong wobble, in fact. 
Uh, I have been told or I've read that there is a software update coming, I mean, imminently. Somebody said they had it. Uh, I, I haven't as yet. Um, that apparently fixes that or improves the electrical uh, electronic image stabilization Im image stabilization and if they can do that actually then yeah really good camera all round proper you know up there with the best i compared it against the note 5 in a different video and i think in some ways you'd, you'd have to argue that the 6p was better as a stills camera but then in my video where i compared uh, the video from them both i think the note 5 with its ois still came out on top one thing that both the new Nexus devices do, which I assume is going to be sort of a new feature of Android rather than just for these devices, is double tapping of the power button should open the camera. And this is one of my points. It just doesn't seem... There we go. So I could feel it vibrating. It just doesn't seem reliable enough to me. Um, so let's, let's turn the phone off again. So if I do it slowly, it definitely won't work. Oh, I say that, look. <laughs> and it did. In fact, so maybe that's maybe that's my problem. So it's working fine now. I think actually it might be when it's the, when the phone's been asleep for a little while, uh, it doesn't. And obviously that's generally the case when I'm trying to use it. My phone's been in my pocket for some time. It's not normally when I'm operating. If I'm operating, I just tap the icon to open the camera up. It's when I've not been using it for some time, and I come. So there you go. I mean, it's working perfectly now. Typically, as I'm making a video, um, but trust me, it's not that reliable. And quite often, sometimes I'm sort of pressing it two or three times, and finally it opens up the camera. The other thing I'm not a massive fan of is sliding between, I mean, it's nice and easy, and maybe it's just because I use it one end more than others because I'm tr perhaps trying to do a video comparison, and I open the app up, and it's in, it's in camera mode, and I'm trying to flick it back and forth. Personally, I do prefer just, just give me both buttons on one screen. I'm not quite sure why Google can't do that um, when others can. Um, what else? What else? So I like there's there's a few sort of the buttons you often need to do with flash, and then we've got the HDR button, auto HDR generally the best way to go. The shutter release can be a little slow, so we'll turn HDR off. That's pretty quick. I'm going to turn HDR on, and you get the whole. Th which again, other other phones have managed not to do that. And actually, it looks to have processed that really quick. Oh, no, it's still going. Sorry, here we are. Other phones, it seems to almost be instant, so I'm not quite sure why uh, Google can't do it instantly with the Nexus. Um, anyway, so, I mean, bottom line, actually, yeah, the camera, really quite fantastic. Definitely no longer a weak point like it often has been in previous Nexus devices. We move on to the software. So, I mean, as you would... Perhaps guess this is running Marshmallow, Android's latest. Don't need to tap that. Come on, there we go. I'm there. Android's latest, Android version 6.0, Android security patch level 1st of October. So, like now, they're giving you the sort of a date of when the security patch is from. So, just in case you want to compare, my build is BDM08K. So, I think I've seen a KK uh, is now released, but I've not. I suppose we should check. When did it last check? Two days ago. Mind you, I'd be quite annoyed if it pops up now while I'm doing this review. I don't know why I wouldn't have told me before if it hadn't. Um, so, obviously, you would hope that uh, you're going to get fairly regular, consistent, no, I'm up to date still, updates being on a Nexus device. So, that's a big plus. Um, the ambient mode that we saw in the display. So, the idea being, I mean, obviously, if we get a notification, it kind of lights up in a black and white screen that's low power saving. Um, but still you can read your settings. And in theory, I pick up a device, it's supposed to show me what's going on, any notifications I might have. I tend to find it's only if I lift it up right. So you see how that's come on there? So you pick it up just, you know, if I'm laying on my bed and I pick it up and turn it towards me, nothing happens. If I pick it up upright, there we go. I don't know how well you can see that actually on the camera because it is quite, it is quite dim. But for me, very readable, and obviously I can just interact straight away with with it. So I like the feature, but um, it doesn't always trigger when I would want it to. Having said that, more often than other devices I've used, I seem to be operating it when it's in my pocket. So something must trigger it sometimes. I mean, it doesn't seem to come on when it's upside down. Bring it up right, and there it is. So it's odd. I can't seem to replicate what might cause it to do it, but I, like I say, sometimes I'll take it out of my pocket and I'm, God knows, you know, I'm replying to somebody in email with um, 
don't know why. I don't know why that is. Um, obviously, well, I say obviously, I hope you would understand that actually the Nexus devices are slick and smooth as hell. Uh, and this is no exception. All that processing power and stock Android mean that it really is slick and smooth. I've not noticed any lag, I don't think, anywhere at all. It's just uh, such a such a such a smooth smooth phone, and that was one of the big reasons why I stuck with my Nexus Six when I had that and the Note Four to choose from, um, just because it was so slick. I have seen somebody saying that they don't want to buy a Nexus because Android actually is a bit plain, and I can understand that. It's missing some of the features that some of the others, you know, some of the features that people like LG and Samsung put in these days are actually quite good. Um, but at the same time, I think these days, Android has developed so far, maybe they've not used it for a little while, I don't know. But actually, it's not so plain anymore. And it really is a nice, uh, well-featured, smooth operating system, even at its sort of base level. So we're going to move on just to mention the battery. It's actually one of the biggest batteries. It's non-removable, unfortunately, because all metal body. But it is 3,450 milliamp hours. Um, it is missing Qi charging, QI, Qi charging, the wireless charging. So you can no longer just drop it onto a charging plate like you could with the last Nexus uh, and the one before, for that matter, which I think is a bit weird. Uh, Google sort of said that their reasoning for that is because of USB-C and how fast that can charge and how great that is. And it's so easy to plug it in now because it's reversible. Um, mm, I'm not buying it myself. I, I would still have liked Qi charging. Um, it also uses its own proprietary fast charge, which is no longer Quick Charge 2.0. I guess that's to do with USB-C, um, but it does still actually Quick Charge. Uh, although I didn't find it quite as fast as my Note 5. So in 30 minutes, in using Google Plug, Google Cable, uh, it went from 17 to 58%. So it had a 41% gain in 30 minutes. Whereas I'm fairly sure my Note does kind of 45 to 50 in that time. Um, but, I mean, it's still good. It's still just, in theory, I mean, I'm sure I've heard people have charged from flat to full in kind of 90 minutes, I think. Um, so the battery itself and sort of battery life, in the first first few days, I was actually a little bit worried, and I was I was thinking, oh, I'm not going to be able to cope with this. It's not, you know, I ripped through, and in day one, I burnt through to sort of 20% in no time. Well, I say in no time. It was like eight or nine hours. Um, but but I'm used to eight or nine hours later, I'm still at 70 or 80. Um but it's, and then I did my battery test a day or two after that, and it did okay. It came out to 88%. The Note 5 came out at 90%. Um, still better than most of the others. The OnePlus 2 was 86%, and the Nexus 5X was 82%. Um, so it did okay. But then it seems to have been over the last few days, so after, after five days or so, it seems to have got a lot better. Uh, and after a day at work, I come home, and I was still on, I think, 75%. Um, I was just hearing one person on a podcast talking about how they'd been, they had a screen on time of two and a half hours and they were still at 75%. Uh, so some people are getting amazing battery life. A lot of people saying just like ridiculously good. I've not experienced ridiculously good yet. Well, let's have a look. Let's have a quick look. So I've had quite a busy day in that I've been to the gym. Um, I've drove there. So I've been streaming Bluetooth music to the car, then streaming Bluetooth music to my headset. Then I've been using the app on my phone to track my lifting of weights. I was then waiting at the hairdresser for 10 minutes or so where I was using the phone. So for me, so one and a half hours, um, for me, at this sort of time of the day is actually quite a lot. Uh, and we're down to 45%. So that's not fantastic, I wouldn't say, uh, but it's not horrific. Like I said, even was, this is my heavier day that I have using the device. I've also been doing a bit of filming and taking some photos to compare against the uh, Xperia 5 uh, Z5 Compact. Um, so it's had, for me, it's had quite a heavy, heavy day. So and you can see, and so it thinks we're still going to get through the day. That's fine by me. Uh, like I said, other days I'm still on 60 odd percent when I plug in at the end of the night, 50 percent maybe, and that's plenty good enough for me. We do also have with Marshmallow. Uh, doze mode. Now, battery optimization. I think this is for doze mode. So there's two things. It's not optimized. They need to be running all the time. But everything else, basically. Oh, sorry. There's a drop down, isn't there? There we go. Everything else, basically, is optimized or optimizing battery use. I believe that means, basically, if I was to leave my phone for half an hour, it's got a particular sensor in the device that's its only responsibility is monitoring the other sensors. 
And if it decides the phone's been left on a desk like that, it basically starts shutting a lot of things down. Now, it would still ring. You'd still get a text message and stuff like that. But um, I'm not sure if someone emailed you that you get a notification because it's decided it's basically been deserted. It let, let's, let's save power. Um, and again, a lot of people, I don't tend to leave my device on a desk like that. I mean, even when I'm at work, it's, it's in my pocket or, well, I'm about. Um, so I don't really see benefits from that. But again, a lot of people saying it's really, really quite impressive. Uh, if that's something that you make use of. So, all in all, battery should get a thumbs up. Um, the other thing I'm going to mention, which I normally don't, is the price, because I've seen quite a bit of talk about the price. Uh, one of one of my followers on Twitter, I think, and I, uh, he sort of tweeted me, said he wouldn't be buying a Nexus because they're drastically overpriced in the UK. Now, I disagree. I mean, yeah, they're a little bit more expensive. So, this 32 gig is £449, but that includes sales tax. So that includes VAT, 20%. If you take that off, you're looking at about £375. Now, in the US, this version is effectively £325. So it's £50 difference. Yeah, that's a reasonable amount, and you could claim that's a rip-off. Personally, I'd only be claiming rip-off if it was kind of 100 or 150 more. Um, I don't see 50p as being that big a deal. I mean, just it's probably it's not particularly relevant, but I worked out how much petrol was in the, in the US, and that's 43p a litre. That's one pound and seven p over here. If you're lucky, uh, you know that's a rip off. This I'm not doesn't bother me so much. Uh, just out of interest for anyone who wants to know, the 64 gig model is 499 pounds, and the 128 gig model is 579. As I said, I think actually I'd recommend the 64 gig just for that extra breathing room. Um, we'll very quickly look at. Oh, there we go. No need for a fingerprint. I just tap. Tap my finger on the back. Uh, where is storage? Storage in USB. So 11 gig used of the 25 available. This is a 32 gig model. model so uh, kind of 7 gig is the operating system. And then I'm using a load more. Uh, leaving 14 gig of it. Does it not say what's free? So it just says what's in use. I thought it used to say what was free. Anyway. So that gives you a rough idea. For a lot of people, 32 will be fine. 64 is probably the sweet spot, though. So, conclusion. Uh, for a long time, Nexus weren't really, I don't think, considered as mainstream devices. I think they were considered a bit nerdy, a bit geeky. They were for developers. But I think recently that's changing, and actually they're being seen now as um, options for your regular Joe. This definitely, without doubt, is the best, ne best Nexus yet. It's not particularly much of a bold claim you know I'd be worried if a year after the last one they couldn't produce <laughs> one that was better than the one before it always makes me laugh a little bit about the iPhone when they say it's the best iPhone yet well I would hope so you only do one a year um, likewise with the Nexus if it wasn't you'd be a bit worried um, but actually I think even sort of comparatively to its peers it's probably the best Nexus that we've had um, there's no weak points really everything is top quality the screen is amazing the speakers are amazing the camera amazing Battery, amazing. Build quality, very, very good. Um, so I'd love my Nexus 6, but actually this one's even better, I think. When you look at sort of, I mean, the, the weak points from the last one, perhaps with the build quality, maybe kind of the size, the bulk, and this is trimmed down. Uh, and, and the camera, again, actually, I would quite like my Nexus 6 camera, but a lot of people would point out the flaws. Um, and this one, not so much, not so many flaws. The electronic image stabilization is a bit of a concern in the camera. The lack of Qi charging is a shame. Yeah, it wouldn't put me off buying it. Well, obviously I bought it. <laughs> wouldn't put me off using it as my daily driver. Um, it's too tall for some people, maybe even myself. So that I'm sure with some devices I've been able to kind of grip it comfortably in in my fingers, and this that's not comfortable. Um, top to bottom, like in a pincer. Sometimes I don't know. Sometimes you just, it's easy to do. So, but it is a very tall device. I think USB-C is going to be interesting. Um, so, I mean, it's annoying almost at this point because, as I've said, you know, you're built up with all these micro uh, USB cables everywhere, and now we're going to have to start changing over. But, you know, I've got I've got Bluetooth headphones that take a micro USB connection to charge them. How long, you know, do I have to buy new headphones that have a USB-C so I can charge with the same cable that I would charge my phone? Is that going to happen? Are the other gadgets like that going to switch over to USB-C? I would assume they are. Um, so it's, it is annoying at this point, but uh, you know I understand it's uh, it's the way into the future. 
and actually USB-C opens up, my understanding is, opens up a lot more options as we go forward. It can take more power, it can transfer data a lot faster. Um, in fact, if I've if I've used a cable to transfer the data off these, I think it does only use USB 2 rather than USB 3, but it's still, it's very quick. I mean, maybe it's because I'm not used to transferring using cables. I generally just use uh, Dropbox or, or OneNote or something. But so USB-C, it'll be interesting. It's an, it is a little annoying at this point, and, you know, these cables aren't the proper spec and things. I think as time goes by and everything adapts to USB-C, it will be really quite handy. Um, so bottom line, I think it's a fantastic device. I think it's all about the size, as with most sort of phablet type devices. If you can handle the size, you really need to consider the Nexus 6P. Try it out in a shop, in your hand, because I think sometimes it doesn't feel as big as you might think it does. The width is, is actually reasonable, and the design of it means that it's, it feels quite good in the hand. But it is, it is a two-handed device a lot of the time because of its overall size. But, like I said before, there's not really many weak points. There's not really many flaws within this device like previous Nexus devices have had. So, all around, top work Huawei, top work Google. Thank you very much for a fantastic 6P. Uh, that's all I've really got to say. Hopefully that's been useful to you. Let me know your thoughts and comments just down below. My name's Andy. I'll catch you all again soon.